Uh, Robin wanted me to say a little bit about myself. Um, I'm working at a consulting firm that has a local office here, Parsons Brinkerhoff, and uh, it's a national firm, sort of specializes in mass transit, typically engineering, but there is a planning side that's also in the firm. Um, I both I have a bachelor's and a master's in civil engineering transportation. Um, my undergrad is at Purdue. I'm a native northwest or midwesterner, and um, my graduate work was done at UC Berkeley, master's degree there. Um, and I did a foray into aviation and airport master planning, but I'm doing more general transportation work now um, with PB and uh, in the land use group here under Sam Seskin, who's also here today. So with that, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is a project that we've been doing with the Oregon Department of Transportation. Um, they've been tackling this bridge problem. In particular, I've been working with a group um, the Transportation Planning Analysis Unit, which is in Salem at their headquarters um, that does planning statewide. So, so uh, what is this bridge problem? You may have heard about it, read about it in the news. Essentially, there's over 500 bridges that they found um, across the state, all over the state, and the cost to fix those, if they were to repair all of them or replace all of them, would be $4.7 billion. Huge price tag, and, and so the question is, how, you know, how do we address this? Um, there's many reasons. We can go back and look at why. I, a couple weeks ago, there was a semina seminar here um, from a researcher from OSU talking about some of the engineering aspects of how we arrived at this point and looking forward about how long a bridge will last. What I'm going to be talking about is more of a policy statement. How do we deal with you know, investment and where should we invest and so forth? Um, the investment, so ODOT had to tackle um, an investment strategy, and what they try to do is balance the cost physically of fixing the bridges with the economic cost that that would impose, depending on where they fix the bridge. Some locations and industries would be more affected than others. So they wanted to get a handle on that, balance that, and decide where which bridges to fix, it, you know, sort of a prioritization. Um, so the bridge costs obviously come from the bridge department that's looking and has investigated and found all these bridges, but where does the economic cost come from? Well, it just so happens that there's a statewide land use transport model that's been under development for quite some years in this transportation planning unit um, of ODOT headquarters. And so it was tasked to evaluate the economic effects of the alternatives. So there's state and regional economy, livability issues, and really look at environmental issues as well. This is just a summary of background on the age of the bridges. So you can see there's a lot of them approaching what is typically thought of as a 50-year life. Just to put this in context, what happened was in 2001, they found that the bridges were cracking you know, on some um, biannual um, inspections and so forth. So that sort of alerted to the problem. They thought these were isolated incidents, but started to connect them together and found out there was a certain vintage of bridges that were really having this trouble. Um, so then a task force was pulled together, what's called the Bridge Task Force. They came out with a report in June that basically validated the problem, said, yes, this is an issue, and it is statewide. We do need to address it. And um, they emphasized that the current approach that they were doing, which was to fix the worst bridge wherever it happened to be in the state, was not going to work under this scenario. There's too many bridges. Almost all the corridors would be blocked if we just did a worst first case. So instead, they emphasized to go, look towards corridors and try to keep corridors open so we can keep freight and so forth moving around the state. So that was in June that they came out with that um, task force report, which is on the web. And then th where I came in was in this third box where there was an economic and bridge options team that was pulled together and um, came out with a report. So we came out with a draft report in December of last year, and then this January um, it was presented at the governing body, the Oregon Transportation Commission. And then at that point, it sort of was opened up for discussion with the governor, the legislature, and we had already co continued to talk with some of the stakeholders, Oregon Trucking Association and AAA, for example, and cities and counties were certainly involved. So that's where it is now is in this, these discussions, and I've heard that in the next couple of weeks, well, actually, there is a bill out there, and there's discussing that among the other budget bills, um, to actually address this, and then the final box is saying, okay, once we get some money, we need to start developing, you know, the particular projects and funding this, this massive effort of bridge investment. <coughs> so this is where all the bridges that are um, either cracked today or restricted in some way 
way um, the load restricted in some way across the state. So you can see there, there's quite a few both uh, locally owned bridges and state owned bridges and a lot of the local ones are already restricted today. Um, the state bridges you can see there's, there's quite a bit on I-5. I-5 is really the big kicker here in terms of um, the cracked bridges and particularly south of Eugene is, is you know roughly a third of the whole price tag we're talking about is, is right there in that corridor. I wanted to point out there's four um, particular emergency incidences that have happened. Um, down at Ford's Bridge down in the south there, there was a, a bridge on I-5 and so trucks were rerouted to either side of I-5 into local communities, trucks over 64,000 pounds and um, 1,800 trucks per day went through some of these small towns that barely even have that as a population. So it was a real big impact for them. If you go over to Coles Bridge, that, that was out, um, had a restriction that went down to 23,000 pounds was the most um, the truck could weigh to continue to operate on regular roads. And there was fire, wildfires that were being fought out there, so some of those places were restricted. Um, up in Salvi Island, the one bridge that goes to the island where all that agriculture is was restricted at 80,000 pounds, and trucks had to go 30 miles an hour across that bridge, even at 80,000 pounds. And then the most recent one was um, trucks, just the very heaviest trucks are being restricted there on the Mackenzie and Willamette River bridges, um, over 105.5, and they're actually required to jog down and use US 97, which is a parallel inland route to I-5. So, um, you know, these are a couple things that have happened in the last few years, and they predict that if, you, if we don't do anything, that this will just continue to happen to more and more communities. Um, and they're saying even 30% of our bridges could be experiencing these kind of issues um, in the next 25 years. So a little bit of background here. I'll start with the freight system. This is a little bit of an old, um, it's 1996 tons that are shown in this, this map here. But I think it really gives a great indication of, of where our goods flowing in the state. You can see the dominance of the north-south I-5 corridor and the east-west I-84 corridor really carrying the bulk of our weight. And over 70% of ton and value of goods shipped in the state is by truck. There, um, the other thing to note is US-97, which is that parallel north-south inland route. It used to be the dominant truck route until the trucks got hardy enough uh, technically engineered-wise so they could t make the grades over in Grants Pass area. So it's definitely shifted to I-5 being the preferred at this point. Um, there are other modes that operate on these same corridors, um, but we, when we started looking into it, there's really select markets. So there may be some way to shift onto other modes. Trucking industry doesn't want to hear about this, but there may be some ways to make some inroads and use other modes to offload some of the you know, heaviest um, um, good flows that are going on, but it's not going to solve the whole problem. So we definitely have to think about fixing the bridges. Um, this, this is just, oh, this is just emphasizing the importance of I-5 and I-84 from the whole nation. Um, I-5 really is a NAFTA corridor between Mexico and Canada. So there's a national interest, too, in keeping these interstates open from a sort of security and trade point of view. What's in these trucks? Well, um, you can see here there's a lot of things that are in the heavier trucks. The very heaviest trucks, over, well, okay, let me back up. Um, 80,000 pounds is sort of a, a threshold in the state. And it, I'm simplifying here because it's really based on configuration as well, how the load is spread out on the axles. But essentially at 80,000 pounds, if you're less than that, you can go anywhere in the state. If you're over than that, you have to start getting permits from the Motor Carriers Division. And you can get an annual permit for the things in yellow there up to 105.5 loads. And then over that, you have to be indivisible to even have that truck. It means you can't break that load. If you can, you have to break that load up into smaller loads. Over 105.5 is just an indivisible load only. And so there's very few of those, and they typically are, you know, your big construction equipment, the actual bridge beams for a new bridge, um, things like that that you can't break up. And those require an actual trip, uh, permit for every trip. So they actually route those trips particularly. Um, but it is the, the most dominant um, goods that are shipped in these trucks that are over 80,000 pounds, which would probably be the typical place where they would limit loads, is forest and farm and agriculture, those kind of goods. So those typically tend to be the heaviest that we're carrying a lot of in the state that are going to be most hit by these restrictions. 
Um, a little bit more on the economy by industry. Um, one third of our industry ec economic activity in the state is service based. Some of the industries that I mentioned that are going to be more affected, agriculture and wood, they've historically been very important. They're not growing as fast as some of the other industries. Um, high tech is a very high growth. It's very concentrated in Portland and doesn't tend to have a lot of heavy goods. By area of the state, Portland is about half of all the economic production. Another quarter comes from Willamette Valley. Um, but really, it's a, a bit deceiving because those are the, both the end market and access to national and international markets. So a lot of the goods from the state come through Portland and to, to either end there or to reach other states. So it's found to be really important to connect Portland up with the rest of the state to keep Portland moving and the rest of the state moving. Um, if we look at this regionally across the state, it's kind of interesting. Um, the chart on the left shows uh, um, goods typically shipped in trucks over 80,000 pounds. What's the share across the state? So you can see it's dominated by Portland making the most of these goods, and then some of the ag and wood areas in the um, southwest and northeast corners in particular. But the interesting thing is if we look at the share of local production, so we take one of these regions and we say how much of it is dependent on heavy goods versus regular goods. Portland, it's just a small pie slice, but if we look at a lot of the other regions, it can be up to half of their local economy is based on these kind of goods. So it's very important for those regions to be connected up, um, up you know, for their economies to continue to, to um, be sustained. They need to have this connection for heavy goods. So um, how, how did we tackle finding out the economic impact? Well, this is a little bit on the model that we used. There's actually a whole modeling program that's been going on since the mid-1990s, and it's looking at some of the most progressive transportation models that uh, you know, are existence in the nation and, the, and internationally for, for the most part. Um, typically, transport was what people were initially looking at when they built models like this. They wanted to know, assign people to networks and so forth. Um, the newer thing is that they started to add in land use. They said, well, the, the transport is depending on what activity is happening on the land, so let's also model the land and, and how it's being used, and then the transport will fall out of that. Well, the newest thing is to add in the economy and say, well, there's really money flows that are going on um, in the economy, uh, connecting up industries and so forth. That actually drives where businesses choose to locate, which leads into transport demand that moves those things around and then that feeds back to the economy and so forth and so on. So this is a progressive model that's going on there. There's an international peer review reviewing it and so forth. There's been a couple applications um, that you can search out on the web. Um, so there's a generation one model which was used in this particular scenario. There's a generation two model that's underway um, since the last couple years which basically just goes uh, much deeper. Instead of taking off-the-shelf Tranis software which we did in generation one it adds a lot more detail. Um, the third I should mention here, you guys might be interested in some of the outreach efforts. Um, Oregon Modeling Steering Committee is really something where various um, metropolitan planning organizations, people that do modeling within the state are connected up um, so they can share resources. Um, so if you hire on as a modeler in Klamath, you can probably hook up with people modeling in Portland Metro and, and share um, knowledge and, and, and uh, computer models and so forth. Second one, there's symposiums that go on uh, talking about this model that bring people from all over the state and nation um, and uh, internationally to some degree um, to those symposiums that talk about modeling. Uh, PSU Center, we've been talking about the research center that's potentially going to be formed here and how this model might play a role in that. So specifically what's going on, this is sort of the guts of the model. Um, we have the economic model at the beginning saying how much money is flowing, how much is made by any industry, who uses what they make, they make, what, what do they continue to make. So there's kind of the, all these connections which comes out in what they call an input-output table. And the location, or the, those money flows, which is what the top box, the economic model is basically just money flows. From that, um, the model decides where to locate a business. So the business needs to buy certain inputs and it needs to sell things to certain kinds of people. So the model will figure out what location is optimum for those you know, d supply and demand needs. Um, then once they locate, there's some, some flows that have to happen. They buy the things and they sell things. Those flows then get converted into trips 
and the transport model assigns those trips to modes and, and uh, network links throughout the, the state. Um, then there's some feedback. So the, the transport model, if we find out that the bridges are cracked and they have to take all these detours, well, the transport model will say that the cost might be high for certain locations and they can move within the state. If they find out that all the state locations are pretty costly, they can move outside of the state and change the economic model. So there's this whole feedback structure going on. So what did we do for the bridge study? Basically, we defined as an input when an industry produces goods, they produce goods that they typically ship in these heavy trucks, heavy goods, and they produce other goods. So we actually split out each industry's good into those two parts. Um, then we went in the transport model and restricted certain um, links of the model so that the heavy trucks couldn't go across. So in terms of flows, heavy trucks so that the industry could continue to put their heavy goods into heavy trucks, but they would have to be detoured. The alternative was for them to not put as many tons into those trucks, keep them light enough so they wouldn't have to go around the restrictions, but both of those would cost the industry, increase, would, would increase their costs, um, shipping costs, production costs, and that would feed back and possibly change their location, either within the state or outside of the state. And then the model realizes that there's connections between uh, like a, a mill and retail. So there's, if there's a mill there, there's a lot of people that have supporting services. Um, they need to buy goods and so forth, and even the mill itself needs to buy goods to, to work. So there's supporting service industries that will travel to some degree with um, the movement of a business. So the first um, couple scenarios we looked at um, are shown here. There's a continuum. The number one is where we just allow everything to deteriorate over time to that legal limit, the 80,000 pounds. At the bottom of this is fixing all the bridges. So it's sort of a continuum in there where we start to fix the interstates, then we add in the freight routes and add in some local routes. Then what I've got here um, column-wise is different sectors of the economy, selected sectors. And all this is relative to a scenario where we continue what we're doing today. There's no problem with the bridges. So what we're showing here is the change in the economy, the production in 2025, relative to if, if there was no bridge problem. So you can see, um, if we look at the agriculture sector, when there, things are restricted, you see some higher growth, the yellow is higher growth, um, in some of the border areas. They, the reason that's happening is because um, these areas are, don't have to travel across the Oregon roads. They can now trade with other states without being impeded by the bridges. So they get a relative economic advantage. When we start to open the interstates, you can see Rogue Valley all of a sudden um, has a relative advantage, so it improves. When we go further and, and put this web in a little bit interior to the state, we start to get central Oregon um, doing a little bit better. But by the end, some of the advantages we had at the beginning are gone. So this is an indication of, of how this affects the economy. If we look at wood, it actually parallels quite closely what was happening with that because they both carry a lot of heavy goods. If we look at technology, there really isn't a lot of variation. They just they don't carry things that typically go in these trucks that are going to be um, detoured or, or have these additional costs. If we look at service, we have similar activities. You know, you see the Rogue Valley hopping up, uh, popping up there, Im improving when we have when we fix the interstates. And again, by the end, you're not seeing any relative advantage for various regions. So this was really informative to tell us um, what was going on when we restrict certain locations. Question? Is this, this is like how you Push the button there. Is that just how you think things will work out if you were to fix the interstates or allow deterioration, or you know that's how it would work out? Well, this is a model, and it simplifies the economy and assumes a lot of other things don't change. But this is this is... Um, essentially in a perfect world, if you only change the bridges, this is the kind of thing that would happen. So it, it helps you to understand the trade-offs that you're dealing with. And, and this was really informative, I thought, to just say if you connect the interstates only, you're going to leave a lot of the state you know, high and dry. They can't get to the interstates, and so they tend to you know, be dampened to some degree economically if we don't connect to them, if we only do the interstates. Did you have a question? I think it might have been what you just said, but I was just looking at the service sector in particular. If you allow deterioration and then the second one where you fix the interstates, it actually seems to worsen for certain areas. 
for the service sector and also for the third case where um, you, in, you improve the freight routes. But I just thought that was really interesting that actually by fixing you could make things worse. It right, right. It's a relative advantage. Um, you, you fix something and um, areas around it may not allow it to get to you. So it's all relative to how you are to your neighbor and a, a business may want to move to your location or somewhere else. You look at overall improvements, though. I Statewide. Mean, yeah, because it almost seems like version two is worse off than version one. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll do, I'll talk about this, a lot of those. But this was just kind of interesting to see this at a regional level because, you know, the state could be doing great, but some regions could really be suffering. Um, so summarizing what we found, if we don't invest. Industry tends to lighten their truck trips, and this is confirmed by um, you know, discussions we've had with various shippers and so forth, that they're going to take, instead of shipping in these heavy trucks, they're going to lighten their trucks. What happens, though, is that they end up having more truck trips to move the same amount of goods. Um, when we start to restrict trucks, if we restrict at 80,000 pounds, it impacts 30% of the tons moving in the state. If we further de um, decrease it down to a limit of 64,000 pounds, which we did see in a lot of the anecdotal examples, um, you're starting to affect 90% of your truck tons. So you're really you're talking about your Safeways now and so forth, the trucks that get to them. And when we restrict it at that level, we um, increase by eightfold the impacts to the state economy. So, and at the 64-pound restriction, 64,000-pound restriction, the economic impact was $14 billion in the out year and 88,000 jobs in 2025. And then if we accumulated that over 25 years, it was $122 billion. These are numbers you're probably seeing in the newspaper if you've picked that up. Yeah. So I'm just asking this for my personal wanting to know. Uh -huh. If we don't increase or if we don't fix the bridges, it'll create more jobs? No. No, this is a loss of jobs as a result of not investing in the bridges, not fixing the bridges. So by investing $4.7 over the next, like, seven years or so, we'll be saving $80 billion? We'll be saving $122 billion over 25 years. That would be lost if we'd let the bridges deteriorate. It would be $4.7 billion to fix all the bridges in the entire state of Oregon? Right. It's, um, that's $4.7 billion invested now, and this is uh, what you would reap as a reward over those multiple years. They're not directly comparable um, because it's not all the benefits or all the costs. So, but. Okay, so um, other issues that would happen if you don't invest in the bridges is you're starting to put a lot of these trucks onto local roads if they can't go on the interstates and so forth. These local roads aren't equipped to deal with, you know, they're not designed for heavy trucks. Um, they go down local streets, down city centers. Safety and maintenance costs obviously will increase, and we're not accounting for any of that in here. Um, truck miles uh, will increase on unsuitable roads, similar to what we just mentioned, local roads. There's also other places that are restrictive geometry, just, just not good places to put your trucks. Motor carriers actually restricts a lot of places for oversized vehicles. And we don't want to put vehicles in environmentally sensitive areas. So this would happen, this is an indicator of what would happen if we don't invest in the bridges. At a sub-state level, um, you saw some of that before, but basically the impact, the cost to ship things, the increase in cost to ship things, would be paid by those that are already paying the highest shipping cost. You have um, some of these industries, wood and and agriculture and, and mining and so forth that already pay pretty high shipping costs because they have pretty heavy goods. Um, the areas that are remote that have longer distances to get to market are also paying high shipping costs. Those are the two locations or two sub-state areas and industries that would be most affected. Um, an interesting finding was that if we fixed all the bridges and the shipping costs stayed low, they're pretty low right now, if they stayed low, we end up having longer trips. Um, so there's no incentive for me to buy goods next door if it doesn't cost me any, you know, marginal amount just to buy it all the way across the state. So there's a tendency to have longer trips with low shipping costs, and that ends up having more VMT for the state because the trips are longer, same number of trips possibly, but longer trips, um, and, and it decentralizes activity and it causes more VMT. So there's some consequences environmentally and so forth with keeping shipping costs low. 
Um, the other thing I mentioned, Portland is a market or a link to external markets for the state, so it's important to keep Portland connected. Um, any investment that we put into the model showed that there was a stimulus um, happening from that, and it, and it overall improved the state economy. Um, and then some of the major regional consequences we found is um, the bulk of cracked bridges being in the Rogue Valley and Southwest certainly have a negative impact for them. Um, if we fix the interstates alone, the benefits uh, statewide look pretty good, but it ignores some of the, the economies in the central and coastal areas. And we found that um, there are some relative advantages um, to urban areas and borders um, of the state if we, if we did not fix the system. Here's the quantitative um, bar charts to kind of back up um, those findings. What I'm showing here is, is the economy. Um, it's the production of goods and services. And it's a growth in that goods and services for various regions and the industry. Um, the, you can see the state impact doesn't look too bad in any of them. It's not that big. But when you look regionally, there's, there's quite a bit of difference, um, particularly in the Rogue Valley, the um, southeast and central part of the state in the center of the bar chart there. And um, then we mentioned that southeast actually has a relative advantage. You can see that um, in the bottom bar chart. Basically, I, I guess I should mention here that the blue is where no money is spent, and there was three versions of that. You restrict at the most restrictive, 64,000 pounds. You restrict at 80,000 pounds. Or you restrict things right now proactively to say, let's save some life on our bridges. So it was happening all of a sudden. All the bridges were restricted. The, the red options are where we invest. And I have two options there where we fix everything um, over the next 10 years, and then a recommendation, which I'll talk about in a bit, but it's sort of at just about half that price. Um, and then we saw by sector, um, the major ones being hit there are agriculture and forestry, the most variation if we restrict the bridges. And wood is actually going negative growth um, in, in our model if we don't do anything, if we restrict it to the most severe. Um, this is the local impacts, the way we quantified those. And what we're showing here is the same scenarios, but now our metric is um, the growth in truck daily vehicle miles of travel. So you can see again that um, the most severe restriction, the dark blue, is having you know, quite a bit of impact, particularly in truck VMT going through cities of various sizes and some of the unsuitable road segments, the sharp turns and... and uh, scenic byways and things like that, places where we don't want trucks to go. Um, things improve quite a bit if you go to the red investment options. Um, and what's kind of interesting here is that um, it, oftentimes fixing all bridges is actually worse in some of these measures than the recommendation we're posing. And we chalk that up to the situation I mentioned where if there's low shipping costs, people tend to travel further to get some of their goods. And so the, there's just more travel going on. And some of, you know, that means more truck vehicle miles traveled in certain habitats and some of these places where we don't want trucks. This is just, um, I guess I should have mentioned, the environment didn't have as much variation as some of the other areas. And what we found is that there's so many places where we were looking at uh, threatened and endangered state and federal species. Th threatened and endangered species, both at the federal and state. This shows some of the location of the federal endangered species. You can see there's, it's, it's all over. So almost any option puts trucks in, uh, in these areas. So a little bit more on the recommendation that ODOT did, which I think um, worked out quite well. Um, it's a $2 billion option, and it would start investing in bridges over 10 years. It wouldn't invest in all of the bridges, but it strategically invests in a number of bridges, I think about two, 300 bridges over the next 10 years. And um, so 2 billion instead of the 4.7 billion would be over 10 years. Um, the big thing we found out was that we really needed to address not only the interstates, but some of these other corridors and get connections to the full state and to the full state. Um, it, and that's really pointed out by this bar chart where you can see, okay, we want a north-south route. Um, I-5 has, you know, almost 200 bridges, 150, 200 bridges. The alternatives to that have, you know, 10, 
20 bridges. So it was very clear that, that the idea was to set up some detours so then we can tackle this sort of long construction process that we're going to have on our interstate system. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, over 90%, at least in our model, which is somewhat simplified, of the statewide economic benefit that we found would be restored um, with this. It, well, 90% of the fixing all bridges would occur with the recommendation. Um, and then often the livability impacts were actually better for the recommendation than they would if we fixed all the bridges. There is some consequences. I'll show you in a minute the scenario, but it basically walks down I-5 and keeps adding, adding more, um, continues fixing I-5 until it reaches the California border, starting up at Portland and moving down. And so there's an initial investment, initial investment in US-97 instead of I-5 to establish a detour, and that ends up boosting some of the Central Oregon growth. So there's an economic boost there. Um, and the delay in fixing I-5 to Eugene and, and South um, dampen some of the growth for Rogue Valley and Lane County. So this shows the stages that um, ODOT recommended to um, OTC and the legislature. First was what they kind of call the blue light special. They could do this with existing monies. They don't have to get any more money. Um, but this would provide a north-south and an east-west link and connect up Portland for up there, um, you know, less than $100 million. The next two stages are significantly more expensive. We're talking six, seven hundred million dollars. Um, we get all of I-84 here, and we get down to Eugene um, on I-5, and then we consecutively add to finish off I-5, and again, that's another big chunk. And then we start to add in some of um, the other connections, and some of these are pretty easy in terms of they just have an oddball bridge or two um, that they would go in and repair. So your money goes a little bit further with these and likewise stage five is similar. So and then in the, I should mention this emergency repair fund. They're saying if you fund everything we tell you about works it's estimating that we'll need three hundred dollar three hundred million dollars to address you know things that pop up um, emergencies on bridges on these routes or on other routes and so they set that at three hundred million. Now they're saying if you only do stage one and two we're going to need more emergency funds because more things will pop up because we're not fixing the bridges in stage three, four, and five. So that's kind of a minimum emergency repair fund. So all told, it's about $2 billion. So that's um, the study, just a couple summary comments here at the end. Um, this statewide model, I felt, was really valuable in pro providing perspectives. I mean, we sat in there with um, you know, Bruce Warner, the director of ODOT, and some of his other people, and it was really valuable in, in weighing some of the trade-offs and really getting a mental model of what what um, you gain and lose with different scenarios to get us to arrive at, at that um, recommendation. Um, this is kind of a new model. We've never used this on such a high profile thing. So there were challenges. One of them was just you know, interpreting results um, in time that people wanted them. Um, people didn't know about this tool. They didn't know the guts of it or they needed, wanted credibility, things like this. So that was something that took us some time. And the people at ODOT, in some cases, we're not as uh, connected to the model because it talks about economics, and they don't necessarily do that. So sometimes it was pulling in people from other agencies that were more excited about what the model was talking about. Um, and then in general, we've had a lot of interest, you know, s statewide and other issues, and then nationally, people are looking at this as, you know, a successful high-profile application that assists in policy and investment decisions. Um, so they're also interested in wanting to know um, how this worked and, and how it played into the decision-making process. Um, our next steps is we're working on a technical report on this bridge work, particularly. Um, the bridge stuff is still going through the legislature. They're talking now about um, doubling registration fees and doing some title fees to raise um, pretty much all. Basically, I think they've decided they're going to have a package. It's just a matter of how much money and where exactly it's going to come from. Um, and if there's any, you know, when the money comes out, if there's need for the model to help in further prioritizing the particular projects, maybe within a corridor. Um, there, actually, there's been a talk that this staging approach may not be exactly what they do, that um, what they may start with is um, there, there's a very select group of bridges that are really critical, and they might go and do those first and do stage one first, so tackle those two first, and then start going through the stages on corridors. But they know some that are 
not looking good that they really want to tackle first before they become part of an emergency. Um, and then I guess the other thing we're doing outside of the bridge is trying to look at other applications for this model and continue to develop the model. And that's it. There's some websites for you. The actual report that we gave in December um, is available on the web. And uh, the, the program for this whole modeling effort has a website with lots of good papers, the Oregon Modeling Improvement Program, and that's the second site on there. Question? Um, so you mentioned uh, in the beginning of your presentation. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation about some of the options of moving the heavier stuff to trains, and uh, the trucking industry is not as excited about that. So in your final report there, you had op all your options. Um, is there another report uh, to dealing with the train issue uh, to, to make it clear to the legislatures or the ODOT uh, how that should play into the, the big picture of the... Office? Right. There's an appendix in here that talks about that issue and talks about what we should do next to try and tackle that issue. Um, I haven't heard a whole lot of interest from the communities, um, communities being like the rail community and so forth, um, wanting to pursue that a lot. But, um, I mean, it's in here, and it's sort of part of the recommendation. We did find that, you know, you have to dig in because it's very um, market-specific. You know, each end that you're serving has to be on a rail line or something. So you really need to look at particular markets and, and where they need to travel. So it's not that it's a blanket thing. You have to kind of drill in and find the particular places where it's applicable. But the good news is that the kind of stuff that travels on rail is heavy goods. I mean, it's the same kind of goods. So in that sense, there's some transferability. Let's follow up. Because, um, you know, one of the things is a lot of the, pri the rail are privately owned yeah. routes. And so the interstates and roads are publicly owned. So we feel as if there's a responsibility to uh, uh, build capacity for heavy weight uh, on our public ways. And public has to solve this problem where uh, the rail could maybe maybe there should be a policy or something where as heavy stuff comes up across the California border, there should be some terminus in southern Oregon where it gets on a rail and we send it on rail. But is there no public uh, right. I mean, motivation to do that? It's an industry's industry decision to decide what mode they travel on. You can't, I mean, at this point, we haven't forced any industry to go on a certain mode. So that's a market-driven decision. So the most under that environment that, um, and it, the state could do would to set up those facilities and make them as attractive as possible to smooth it so that they would choose that. But to some degree, there's not much, um, much more you can do without changing the whole system and forcing, you know, not to be a market decision anymore. Just la last comment is, if I was a legislator, slater or whatever, I would say, well, the best motivation is not to fix the bridges, and. Uh, <laughs> And then make them say, well, geez, we can't go. It's too expensive. Rail is cheaper. That's, that's the way to do it, maybe. I don't know. Well, you know, actually, um, Representative DeFazio had a similar comment to this. And so he's been, I think you might be able to find his response here or through his website. But, yeah, I mean, that, that's definitely a policy decision that could be made. Um, but to some degree, if, you know, if it gets down where it's starting to restrict at 64,000 pounds and your Safeways are having trouble moving and, you know, they have stores all over that are not next to rail lines, and to a large extent, if you're on rail, you have a truck connection. So it's a little bit more mixed up than not quite as straightforward as that, but good ideas nonetheless. It looks like all of the scenarios that you analyzed involve you know, various amounts of shifting of trucks with heavy loads onto roads that uh, may not have been designed to carry those loads. Uh, and so increasing damage off the main routes. Uh, did you consider uh, options of, or implications of imposing restrictions on provision of extended weight permits that would go in conjunction with those scenarios? We didn't consider any of that. Um, a lot of times when we brought up ideas, our hands were somewhat tied, you know. We don't want to tackle that. We don't want to um, change the cost allocation formula, how much the trucks uh, pay in the state versus how much, you know, private autos pay. Um, I'd love to run other scenarios, and we do, you know, since this has economic, we actually ran some tax, tax what I call tax and spend scenarios, where we actually taxed autos and trucks at current allocations 
and then spent the money in the construction sector, which produced jobs and so forth. So we had you know, some of those plays, but there's a lot more variations you could do, but we were kind of told, don't touch that. <laughs> um, when the economic flow table model was created, um, you were saying that in the, in the survey people lied. So is, is that what you said? No, I don't think so. What's that? The, the input-output table, the money flows in the economy, or? The economic flow chart that you created, if you go back through the slides. Might be easier to start from scratch. <laughs> oh, really? OK. Much better. This one? Come on. There, that one? Yes. Okay. Oh, I did, maybe I heard you wrong then. I, I thought you said there were surveys that were created and, and this is how they made that economic models from the surveys? No, no. Um, this is driven, the, the economic model box up there is um, data that Implan, which is a company that does this nationally, they will tell you, there's a matrix that says, here's all the industries and what they make, here's all the industries and what they use coming from other industries. So it's not, I mean, they go around and do all their survey and data collection to come up with this, and you can buy this for any particular state, but that forms the basis for this. So it's pretty good data, and it's money flows. I don't know how... <laughs> Not sure what your question is relative to that. I well, there's no question. Okay, all right. <laughs> Sorry if I misled. Okay. Um, with the weight restrictions as they come down, at what point does it become like a public safety hazard as far as failure? Um, autos are really light, you know, they're just a couple tons. So those don't matter too much. What we were more concerned with is if you have a fire engine or you have an ambulance or you have a school bus. Um, and those are more in the 20 to 30,000 pounds at the high end. So largely they won't be affected unless, you know, it really plummets south. And actually what they have told us about the bridges is, the, is that it quickly deteriorates. Um, because they've been trying to, this work at OSU is trying to gauge, you know, when, when is it really a, when should you close the bridge? Not only just restrict, but actually close. So, but I, it's when you get to those weight levels that you're talking about really local, local emergency response impacts. Rob? The question about the, the graphical representations at the county level with the color coding associated with uh, percent impact, and I was wondering if you experimented with other. I'm wondering whether the picture would change if you either use a different uh, geographical level of resolution. Just because in a county, I mean, a county boundary is kind of arbitrary in some ways. But I'm just wondering, more just philosophically, how how the picture would change if you used a different um, different visual picture. And just, I mean, obviously the people who the, the county supervisors or, or whomever county commissioners are concerned about their county, but I'm just wondering if you played with that at all. Yes, we did quite a bit. Actually, it's not even at counties. It's at our zone level. So that's the lowest we can go in our model. The new gener There's like 123 zones in the state for our model. Generation 1, the Generation 2 goes to 3,000 zones. Um, th you know, we're getting requests now, hey, can we repackage this stuff at congressional districts? Because right, they're looking at it, and so they want to know about their district. So, I mean, I guess the, the bare bones, you can do this, this zone, which is as low as we go, and then you can go two counties, which would be collapsing this a bit and, and, and on up. So we tried all kinds of metrics, actually. This was one that I really liked this, and uh, when we showed it to some people, they just didn't get it. You know, what is this? I, I don't know what you're showing, but it's so rich with information. But people aren't used to seeing this stuff. People aren't used to talking in economic terms. They know what VMT is maybe, vehicle miles travel. We've been talking about that for five or ten years. But when we talk about the economy and the production of goods and services, what does it mean to be 2% off or whatever? There's, there's not really a rule of thumb. So we struggled a lot with how to simply transmit information so that people could get it. Yeah? Also, if you look at the 
you look at that map um, with respect to that service sector column, uh, what's going on in southwest Oregon that uh, the, their best options are the two extremes, do nothing and do everything? Um, well, to some degree, the, let me think about this. Right. Um, I mean, they're somewhat influenced by the, the regions around them as well. Um, offhand, I'm not coming up with the particular reason for that region. I'd have to dig into it a bit more. But I mean, those were certainly the kind of questions that we're asking looking at these graphs. And I may have more explanation in, in the report on that as well. All right. Question? Uh, um. I have a question about, I, I kind of see and uh, appreciate you, the attempt of this study to uh, balance like different regions and treat them fairly and, uh, but what, at what point did you decide to uh, uh, treat everybody fairly or rather than saying, okay, um, weighing, weighing these regions is saying, well, the Portland metro region, I don't know what, what you call it in this, this in your, your zone, your uh -huh. Portland zone or north zone, central zone or something, um, weighing them and saying, well, we want to fix bridges that will have the biggest impact first. And sure, yeah, that may cause central Oregon to lag for a while, but they're only 10% of the, the, the region. Was there is a political choice to, to, to go by zones and say, hey, we want to make sure all the zones get some benefits and that's why you picked your stage, stage levels? Or right. why I mean, didn't you pick weighing things? We try to think of this as this is a tool. Um, people can make decisions. This is providing information to make those decisions. We didn't want to have any policy implications in the data we fed people. We wanted them to get raw, objective as much as we could data, and then they could weigh those decisions you know, at the legislature level to decide what they wanted to do. But we wanted to point out if you only do the interstates, this is what's going to happen. And, you know, so that's what our objective was to try to keep as unbiased as we could, bring it down to as regional level as made sense to to share information unobjectively, and then let the decision makers do the politicking and deciding on that. I like follow-ups. Um, if uh, so, then in this case, looking at it in this manner, if we just based went off of the, this study only, mm -hmm. um, we could go for the make. The stages you chose, I think they were called stages, stage right. one, stage two. Uh, the first stage was like central Oregon, a lot of central Oregon. Right. You, um, we could then, uh, uh, maybe the majority of the economy would still go downhill, even you know during that first four years or three years or whatever of stage one, because the majority of the economy is not in that area. So, so in terms of solving the economy problem, uh, that this model may not do that. Um. So it's going to show. Um, trying to get to those bar charts. I'm going backwards. Um. Anyway, uh, so your question was. I think you passed. <laughs> no, going okay. Backwards, forwards. Okay, so I'm, if you could reiterate. Well, um, goods typically in trucks over 800 So the, top, the left graph with the uh, uh, highest percentage of uh, big heavy goods being shipped around the, the west and north. Uh -huh. uh, so in terms of uh, the biggest bang for your buck of investment, mm -hmm. if, you, if the strategy invested first in those darker areas, um, they would make the biggest bang for the state's buck. Right. Um, where you look on the right side, you pointed out that, well, inside of the region, uh, well, like you look in the far southeast corner, boy, that's almost 50% of the, the local region's economy, but that's, you know, a it's drop a in the bucket economy. compared to the state. So I, understand, I respect that you're trying to give, you know, all the state the success at the same time by, by keeping it equal, but I was saying in terms of bang for the investment buck, we might actually, uh, you know, 
do more if we weighted it. Now, I'm, is there any discussion of that? Well, I mean, the thing that you can look at is we look at a state level, and that essentially weights it by the activity that's in each of those um, areas. So if you look at the state level and you look at, hey, let's just restore at a state level, that would probably fall out because, as you're saying, some of these regions, even though it's a big part of their local economy, that, that's a drop in the bucket relative to the full economy. The state economy can run fine even if, you know, you have total unemployment in, in other places because all their mills and, and their, they can't get their agricultural goods to market. Um, so, you know, those are the kind of trade-offs you can pull from this information. But the state level is sort of your aggregated and weighted to some degree by activity. Okay, Ron? There are a couple questions by email, and then I'm going to add one because I think I know the answer to the email question. Email says, what other states are facing similar bridge crises and which are attempting this type of modeling or analysis? And I'll extend that and say, well, what are sort of, what's the vision of how to, to use this tool for other things in Oregon? Okay. Um, in terms of other states on the bridge problem, they did, um, I think it was FHWA that did a survey, looked at other states. Some, of, some states do have this issue. California has done a lot in retrofitting in the last few years, so any bridges they had like this were updated. Um, Washington has some, but, but Oregon's really unique in the fact that they have a ton and they have them on their interstate. Some other states, I think it was Colorado perhaps, had a lot, but they weren't on their interstate, so they weren't that worried about it. So Oregon is somewhat unique in, in facing this magnitude of problem. Um, using this model for other things in the state, um, we'd love to. We're you know, st still getting our feet wet in terms of using it. Every time we use it on a new application, we add some functionality to the model. Here we had to understand a lot more subtleties about freight than we had up till then. Um, I mean, that's the plan, is to have it be the sort of objective tool that's used in questions um, that are faced by the state all over. You know, we've talked about... Uh, you know, some port studies that might look at a super port in Astoria instead of dredging to Portland. I don't know, this is pie in the sky, but, um, you know, if you have to continue dredging every few years and it gets deeper, you know, maybe there's some trade-offs with getting a super port in Astoria. I have no idea. Um, we've talked about updating the Oregon Transportation Plan, um, which is guides policy for the state and where investment should go in sort of a long-term picture um, transportation-wise. Um, so there's a number of sort of things that are popping up, and, and we're trying to get the models up to speed. Hopefully we'll get Generation 2 on to somewhat eclipse. Generation 1, it has a lot more bells and whistles that you, and dials that you can use for policy questions. Um, so there's all that happening in the background. But definitely we've had a lot of positive response from the bridge work, and a lot of response to people say, let's have the development of the model be driven by applications like this. So a lot of interest. Um, where do you think the money to invest in these bridges is most likely going to come from? Right now, the bill that they're shopping around is coming from doubling the registration fees. It's $15 now, going to $30. And then title fees, I'm not sure how much. Uh, what role do you think this work had in moving the state away from a fixing a worst first strategy into the approach that it's taking now? I can't really credit this report. I think it's the prior bridge task force report, which has really made, more up, made up more of bridge experts and engineers, um, that policy. But they really saw the need that there's, this is such a, a big enough widespread problem that we can't use that old approach. We need to do a corridor approach. So when we started this work, that was, you know, some of our marching orders was look at how to keep corridors open and a funding strategy that would keep that in mind. Is that it? Uh, I, have, I have a question about funding and how you, how you said that you were told not to touch the cost allocation issue because I've heard that trucks actually don't pay their way when it comes to uh, the wear and tear that they place on roads. And it just seems like that cost allocation could seems like it would be an integral part of a land use transportation economic model. And I was just curious as to the reasons why that issue was... Um, why you were asked not to address it? Was it political or 
there's a huge political process that arrives at the formula that they use right now, and there's you know a lot of back and forth with that, and it's actually very complex. You know, how do you say how much is due to the trucks going across these roads as opposed to an auto? It's it's actually quite a complex topic. So there's a lot of gray areas, and it's really a political process that arrives at this formula. So rather than open that Pandora's box, they said, stay with what we have right now, and you know, possibly as we move forward and if that comes up as an issue, that can be addressed in this process too. But for now, we were told to keep with existing um, cost allocation. And so it's hard to say whether they're paying their fair share or not. I, there's people on both sides that would argue that vehemently. So. I just have a question about this. In, so it's in 2001, there were 500 cracking bridges. And is there any study at what rate that is increasing? Um, well, it's actually pretty recent that we found out about this, you know, just a year or two ago. And they've really beefed up their number or their inspectors to figure out how fast these things are, are moving along. Um, and, and even throughout this process, the bridges were a dynamic um, moving target. Um, so certainly there's efforts to look at that. Um, it would be the bridge department within ODOT that would be doing that. I'm not sure what the latest is on that, but I, I would suspect that they're, you know, it's being worked on. Mm -hmm. I hate to bring this up again because it's me just kind of wasting everybody's time, but uh, you said the money comes from doubling reg registration fees from 15 to $30, and what else? And title fees when you buy or buy a car used or new. Uh, when it comes time for actual construction, is there any way to kind of make sure that the funds stay in Oregon and are given to contractors in the area, or is a lot of the, you know, contra are the contracts in the award to out-of-state companies, or is there any way to control that? Well, that would be ODOT procurement policies, and I'm not sure what they are in place now, but certainly there was conversations while we were doing that that the magnitude of what has to be done here, both in a design and a construction, is more than we probably even have in this state. Um, that ODOT was talking about sharing staff with WashDOT, um, you know, so a share policy so they could quickly tap into um, additional people to help with this. And I'm sure, you know, big firms like I'm from, um, Parsons Brinkerhoff, has a national network of people that they can pull in to help on, um, you know, if they design, a, say, get a whole court or project or something like that. So, um, I don't know exactly what's in place for ODOT policies today in terms of regulating that, but to some degree, it's sort of inevitable that we're going to have to go outside. Okay. Thank you. Before we thank Tara, I just want to remind you that, well, thank you for coming. And next week, we're in 454 Newburger Hall, and Mia Burke will be talking about rails, trails with rails. So, Tara, thank you very much. Thanks.